And we are live. Happy St. Patty's Day. Well, I guess it's, I guess we're a couple days late, but a couple days late. I'm always late on everything for anyone who knows me. But happy St. Patty's Day to everyone out there. So we're gonna be having a really special podcast. I've been wanting to have Brian on here for a while. Um, as we're kind of getting things going, and there's only a few people I wanted on for this topic, just because there's so many different opinions, and I wanted to get a really good base for it. But we're going to be talking today about investment reptile breeding. So with some people, it's kind of a taboo subject, but I kind of wanted to go into it. People used to ask me that all the time, um, and I just hear a lot of different things. So we're going to be talking probably mostly about ball pythons, but a little bit about other species too, and just kind of your opinions on it. Um, so right off the bat, I'm just going to ask you kind of a stupid question. What's your favorite ball python more? So we get Cl Clown pied, without even a doubt. Clown. Has been has been from the beginning, still is today. It's clown pied. That was the fastest response I think I've ever gotten on that. So. Well, I, I've been asked it a, a, a number of times, and also I just, that's it. I, it's still, nothing yet has... And probably nothing will. I don't think it's all. It's all going to be different iterations of clown pie that that really do it for me, and and it Absolutely. has been. Hey, Madman Serpents, how how's it going? So then, I think the second question I, I wanted to ask, because you know, with the whole game stock uh, stock craze that went on, I think that's kind of a great example for some reptiles. Is with investment reptile breeding when you're looking at different genes. How are you deciding between actual market value, um, things like clown pies that have held their value that are absolutely gorgeous, double recessive, and crazes that are potentially going to crash later on and are just kind of in that moment craze with a bunch of hype but don't really have that long-term value, if that makes sense. Well, let, let me say I didn't. I didn't catch. I know there was some big thing that happened with the stock market and, and GameStop. I've of course heard. Of, I've of course heard about that because I, I look at my phone. And I think that if you have a phone, it was kind of hard to miss <laughs> that one. But I don't know much about it. Also, as far as investment breeding goes, I mean, I wouldn't consider myself anywhere near the top echelon, even close. I, I'm definitely more of a hobbyist. Not to say that I didn't invest some pretty serious money into ball pythons in particular. Um, I did. You know, for me, I, I put I put a good good chunk of change in there to start out with, and and have been fortunate enough to make. Uh, back the investment at the very least, and and more so. Um, what was the question? <laughs> oh, it's all good. Um, just kind of deciding because, like, with the whole GameStop thing, it was based oh, decide on, decide like what to what to work with. Yeah, not exactly that, but deciding between like long term, like how to actually pick out a gene that's going to have long term value um, compared to something that's just kind of in a hype phase, but in a year is going to be half of that or a quarter of that value that you. Well, it seems like most. If we're talking about ball, if we're talking about ball pythons, it seems like most drop at, at a similar rate. You know, I mean, some may drop a lot faster than others. I, I'm newbish to it, so you know, I've I've been breeding that for like five years. There's there's been a lot of things that happened previously that I that I kind of missed. With I do know that the original pied sold for like 125k or something. Obviously, you can now get a single gene pied for like 350, 400 dollars. So it's that's always going to be a supply and demand thing. You know, once there's a bunch of pies out there, you can't look, you can no longer charge 125 K for them because it's not the first one anymore. So that happens, I think with every single morph. And I think it just comes down to how hard is it to work into other projects? So the recessive projects are going to hold value longer because it takes longer to work them into other projects. So it's just, a time thing like how long does it take to work this in and then how powerful is it is it a, is a thing too i mean how much does it have an effect what combos have been made it's much more intricate than just picking out this morph or that morph because it looks cool which is what i did and what i still kind of do is like oh i like the way that looks and that's that's why i got into clown pied and it just happened to be that it was a double recessive animal that had high value at the time and still has continued to hold value I'd, I'd say it was a stroke of luck because i just literally just looked at it i was like "Ooh, i love the way that snake looks and i still I'd like, as i said i still do and i had no idea what it cost at the time when i saw it i was just like that it, in fact it, it didn't have a price i don't think when i saw the snake that i wanted it was on the uh it was on uh oh my god there's so many names that i, I can't tsk um okay snake keep dan and colette sutherland it was on their yeah. site 
And I was like, that snake right there is amazing. And I reached out to them and before I knew them. And they're like, it's this much. I was like, Ugh! <laughs> how do I, how am I going to do that? How am I going to explain that to my wife? How am I explain that to anybody <laughs> that, I, that's, that I think takes me as a somewhat serious person anymore? <laughs> the list just gets smaller every year. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it was luck. But to, to really answer your question, I think that, the harder it is to work it into a project, that's that's longer it's going to hold its value. And then who's working the project too? You know, it's, it's knowing about all the different breeders out there who are working with certain things. You know, there's there's certainly people, certainly people out there that are known to just like undercut a project and make it go down really quickly. Um, versus like if it's just a one person who started with something and you can trust them to not release it and, and undercut you on the price afterwards and kind of work the project in that way. So it really also comes down to who's working with the product even more so than is it recessive? Is it incomplete dominant? Is it powerful? Are there, those are made cool combos. And is somebody that's working with it going to be somebody you can count on to not undercut you heavily and just take the project from the financial aspect and just tank it, I think. Absolutely. You know, and that, that's actually a perfect segue. Um, the whole a breeder crash in a market one of the things that, you know, I hear so many different varied opinions on is outside of charity auctions, which we see all the time for, you know, US ARC and things like that. How do you feel about auctions when it comes to just a breeder auctioning off their stuff? Do you think that decreases the value of a project? Yeah, I mean, it certainly can if that if it doesn't have the right amount of outreach. I mean, it depends on how long the auction runs for. Is there a reserve price? I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to run an auction. Yeah. Um, like you said, outside of charity, I think the charity ones are great. Um, oh, and, and they, and they do fantastic. Um, I would like to, uh, sorry, I'm, 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 oh, it's all good. No worries, dude. I'm in a place. <laughs> um, there, there's, uh, so I did an auction on my YouTube channel at one point. The, the, I think I, I did it one time. I did a for one for one animal. I just kind of just want to test the waters. At, at that point, at past that point, a lot of people have done auctions on YouTube Live, and I think that can do, can you excuse me just one half a second? Oh yeah, yeah, no worries. How's it going, Delane Exotics, Iron Dog Reptiles, Madman, and of course Kimberly. I I made some silent threats. So we should no <laughs> um, the the uh oh my god sorry I lost train of thought and i i did it try just trying to gauge what was out there and I actually i set the reserve price at what i wanted to sell the animal for so there's all kinds of different ways to do it i don't think that doing it is bad depending on how it's handled you know it's, it's the nuance like how how what are the rules behind the auction like i did another one where i put up uh one of the first sunsets i produced but i set it at the price that I wanted to not let it go for. So there's a difference, you know, there, there's auctions. If you have no reserve price and it can just go whatever for the, whatever the highest bid ends up being, could be super low. That could potentially be bad for a project, you know, or it, it could be, it just depends on where it's at. It can be done wrong and it can be done right. It, I think I that's true of a lot of the things that are involved with this hobby, but there's, there's ways to do it right and there's ways to do it wrong. Yeah, I, I think that's a perfect way to, to actually. I think the it. wrong way to do it. Here's the wrong way to do it. You want you want have an animal. You don't have a name for yourself, so you're having trouble selling it. It's a high end animal. It's gonna you know we're talking four maybe even five figure animal, which is this is really hypothetical, but again the wrong way. And you just run an auction, and maybe ten people catch wind of this auction. Somebody gets into an animal that could have costed you know like twelve k or something for a G. And there goes the value for that particular moment. You know, it's not to say that further ones beyond that couldn't still survive, but anyway, anyway, that's the wrong way to do it. No advertisement, no reserve prices, high end animals going for really low. That's a bad option. <laughs> yeah. I really like, really like that answer. Um, you know, another point with the whole investment reading, and it's something uh, my old boss, Jay, uh, at prehistoric pets used to talk to me about all the time. Um, is when it comes to, you know, when you're investing, say if you have a set amount of dollars, which pretty much all of us have, um, are you looking more for a quantity of animals, say to buy, you know, 10 head pie combos, or are you looking to get really high end, 
high quality animals, but fewer of them. What do you think is the better long term strategy with that? In your well, when you when you say quality, you're talking about like the amount of traits, genetic traits within the animal, or like because okay. Ozzyoids or Orm's dreams would be a perfect example. Something that is you know a little bit higher quality just as far as visually, and also having some extra genes in there, but getting well, then less. You, then you could also have low end. Man, people are going to be in trouble after this, I'll tell you that. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a, well, even with orange dream, like you could have a high expression orange gene, or even like obviously singled out, like an even higher expression of orange dream within his orange dream line. Um, you, there's that there's that aspect of quality, like a high quality pastel versus one that yeah. like, is starting to turn brown to like 300 grams. Um, there's that level of quality. There's also... I'm, I'm going to answer your question, I promise. But uh, I just want to talk about some of the things I think about when it comes to quality. Like, yeah, absolutely. You, you, and how much you end up paying for it. it, it again, it comes down with who you're working with, I think, too. Like, there's somebody that's willing to just sell the animal before it's had more than two meals, say. Like, it's maybe barely had its first shed, not well taken care of, not, um, and, and, you know, the, the customer service level, like, just barely getting the animal there alive, and then, that's it. You paid your money and the guy's gone. Like you can find stuff like that for much lower price for an animal made with the similar, you know, genetics. I personally have a little higher price on my animals because I know I'm putting in a little extra care and time and that people know that they're going to get, or they don't know it, but I know that if somebody comes to me for an animal, they're going to get the animal that is like in perfect health in, in the best, you know, barring any things that I've seen, I actually lost an animal in shipping last week for the second time ever, which is horrible and sucks. Yeah. Um, and, but I, I'm still, even with that, like I've taken care, I always make sure I got everything covered with insurance so that if something horrible like that happens, we're covered. And then my, my customer is not gonna be left flat on their face because of a mishap like that. Like th everybody's gonna be taken care of in the end. And, uh, and when they do get the animal, like if anything happens <laughs> further, like I'll, I like to stay in communication with anybody who's got an animal from me for, forever basically so yeah. there's that level of quality that's something i think when we say quality like how, price and quality it's like what are you getting are you just getting an animal that's like barely made it and it's like had a couple meals and then you're never gonna hear from the person again you got it from or you get an animal that's been like meticulously raised uh, had plenty of meals and is like ready to thrive and then somebody who's going to back it up with every ounce of their dignity that's a certain level of quality versus price um if it comes strictly to like less expensive stuff for me when it comes to when i think about the investment side of it and this is something i think more and more people are gaining knowledge about it's like especially when you're talking about something like ball pythons or even reticulated pythons any basically any python species the females take longer to reach sexual maturity and so you invest that money into maybe some females that are het for the recessive trait that you want to work into the animal say say you're really into clown <laughs> So just, just, just hypothetically, you're a clown, a clown pie, I don't know, let's say, and you want to have some amazing project to work down the future and you have a certain amount of money you want to put in. You take about half of that money and you put it into some females that are maybe double head clown pied that have a couple incomplete dominant traits that you think are going to work really well or that you know, based on other breathings, work really well. You raise those up until they're getting closer to be ready. And then you drop the other half on this one male that's like a double visual clown pied with other incomplete dominant traits that you want to work into it. And you can put him to those other females you got. And that's the, I think the best way to do it as far as like quality and money. And uh, it's one of the more foolproof ways, I think. I don't think I've heard a better explanation of that. That was absolutely perfect on every level. Um, oh, you should get you should get Garrett Harlow on here at some point. I feel like he explains things. Like I feel like Garrett takes things that I have in my brain and like puts them into things that other people can understand. So thanks for saying that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I had him on, and man, I had to edit it into three videos because it was so much good information coming. I had to put that into three or four different videos and put it out there because it was. You know, another thing that um, I think the most important thing, and it's something that I, I've seen over a long time when people get in, there's so much excitement when you first get into a project. Um, but one of the things I think a lot of people, especially newer people that are investing into reptiles or have that dream of breeding is, is managing realistic expectations. 
you know, and that's something that, you know, from, from your eyes, what do you see as, you know, what would you advise someone that wants to know, like, what would you expect from doing this for the first time? Because I always kind of tell people it's going to take a little bit longer than you think it's going to. And it almost never goes exactly how you're going to think it's going. There's odds, you know, if it's a one in two shot, you might miss it. You know, if it's one in four you and you could have six eggs, you could still miss it. So there's a lot that can change. So even, how would you kind of tell someone to manage their expectations? Well, here's one thing. Even one of the first females I got, like in the first year I started getting ball pythons, there's this female I've got that just has been slow, slow, slow. We're talking five years later, and this girl will maybe produce in a couple years. I don't know. I don't know. You know, that's there's that. There's that. It's like, oh, I think, you know, maybe two and a half, three years, maybe. I can know, maybe four. Seven, ten, I don't that's that's a decade at that point. It's not that long yet for her, but at the rate she's going, maybe. So I, one of the universal sayings is hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. And it's yeah. easy to say, but to actually mentally prepare for the worst. You know, I had a I had a blood python clutch just a couple days ago that the whole clutch looked perfectly healthy, you know, like and then there's some things I'm going to explain on a video in the next video I put out, actually, that are now now I'm seeing after the fact that were maybe clues to what was coming. But I had no idea at the time. Um, but, you know, totally healthy looking clutch and half of them didn't make it. And just just half of them didn't make it out of the egg. Like. I wasn't expecting so your expectations should be you could lose everything. You want to talk about preparing for the worst. Everything could die. You could spend a bunch of money on all the animals and get some freak accident with like a, a circuit breaker, not tripping when it's supposed to, a building catching on fire. You know, this is, this is worst case scenario, but these are possibilities and these do happen. So, you know, the whole, the phrase with snake breeding in particular works really well here that, you know, not put all your eggs in one basket. Like, yeah. you don't want to spend all your money into something like this and, and just be like, this is the thing that's going to hopefully make it work and, it's life. It's, it's life we're working. It's real, live, living things, and they're fragile. Their life is fragile. It can all be s snapped out and snuffed out of existence in a flash. And that's something to keep in mind when you get, get into something like this. Could happen. You could spend thousands and thousands of your hard-earned money into something like this and lose it overnight. So that's definitely something. I mean, if you can expect that that's a possibility. Then you you got a good start because if you have that in your head that this could happen, I could lose it all instantly. That's a good place to start from. Everything from there that happens better than that is like, oh sweet, I've got some animal stuff, guy. I didn't lose it all. I've, look, I'm producing eggs. I I didn't they didn't all hatch, but I do still have animals that are living. I'm not completely out. I'm not, you know, completely flat broke, flat broken, with nothing. So. That, that's what I would, anybody get into it, like have those expectations of like, I could potentially lose everything doing this. If you put it all in it, then it can be gone, so. Absolutely, I think that is a perfect answer. Um, I really wanna thank you for your time on that. You answered everything perfectly. And you wanna go ahead and shout out um, everywhere people can follow you, because I know you got a few different channels now I've been enjoying. Yeah, well, hey, for, first, before we sign off, I want to thank you for how respectful you were of my time. I, I, I want to be honest, like a lot of people reach out to, to do these things, and I, you were more respectful about my time than 95% of people that reach out to do these things, with, with, without a doubt. So I want to give you a big shout out for that. For And the, if I, I, I don't know if you want to, maybe I shouldn't say this because I don't know if you want to do this all the time, but thank all you right. for the for the whiskey. <laughs> that was oh, awesome. Okay. I wanted to do a chug right for my sign off. I got. I'm gonna finish my booth here. So. All right, all right. I'll finish this glass too when we sign off. So, go ahead, uh, uh, Brian Cusco. Uh, you know the name is spelled oh, down yeah. there. You can find it in Instagram, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and then I got a. I actually have a new whiskey channel. Like shout out, it's called Whiskey Wimps. We just started putting it out. So love that know. channel. Anyways. Oh, you are oh, you watching it? Oh, sweet. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, here you go, everyone. And make sure to check out Oaks and Otters Brewery. Loving the beer. Um, it's over in San Lu Luis Obispo, over in California. So Ooh, anyway. I know that place. Oh, yeah. It's uh, actually my in-laws, their, their brewery. So. Oh, but, sweet. I'll go check. That's my county, dude. I live in San Luis Obispo County. Oh, hell yeah, dude. So absolutely. Well, go check that out, guys. And happy late St. Patrick's Day. So.
He had a little bit more out there than I did. (laughs) Peace out, everyone. Have a great time, and I hope you guys enjoyed. Again, go ahead and follow Brian, and if you enjoyed, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, JT. Absolutely. Thank you, man.